Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Um, can I? My name is Rob Cartridge. I'm here from an international NGO, so slightly outside of the research community. Um, we're called Practical Action. We are a medium-sized NGO, um, formerly known as Intermediate Technology Development Group, for those who have been going a bit longer. We were 50 last year, so we're just a little bit older than IDS, but we've been very much in partnership. And also, in partnership with Eldis over the last 20 years, you know, we're, we're regular partners on different projects here and there, and you know, I think we should really celebrate the impact of Eldis because for all it's difficult to describe, it's had a fantastic role in international development, it's really helped us to move forward, as well as helping the thinking around knowledge and development to move forward. So, you know, congratulations, let's, let's, let's absolutely analyse, let's think about the next steps, but let's also take some time to celebrate the success that you've had so far. Um, so, um, practical action for those who don't know, um, has a long-term commitment to international, to knowledge sharing as part of our DNA. We do stuff on the ground, the same as all international NGOs. We work with communities in a participatory way, generally around sharing appropriate technologies. Um, we see always though through our working model that the work that we do on the ground as a, as a relatively small NGO we need to learn from and we need to share the knowledge from that going to create a bigger impact on both policy and practice globally. So it's kind of knowledge brokering is in our DNA um, but it's not been without its challenges uh, and with lots and lots of learning as we've gone along. So this session, um, the next four of us, and, and we perhaps should have compared notes because I think there's a lot of what's come up already um, will come up again, um, is looking at the, what are the challenges and the opportunities, the institutional challenges and opportunities to that information management, knowledge brokering and research communications. What, what have we learned as we go along? And just to be helpful, make it nice and simple as we're getting close to lunchtime, I've gathered it into five Ps. So that's all you need to remember and I'll put those on the last slide. So if you want to nod off for the next 10 minutes or so, you can do, we just, just come back for that bit. Um, so the first P is um, projects. Projects, the whole way in which our business operates. The log frame, bless it. You know, great, really helpful project management tool, very, very, you know, mainstream to what we still do. For all, lots of us are trying to be different, trying to be flexible. The log frame is still at the core of what we do. It is the business norm. Um, on top of that, you know, the three-year project, the way that donors operate, they'll give you a three-year grant and, and as donors get less and less capacity themselves because they want to cut back on their own overhead, you know, they'll send you away, go away, come back in three years, tell me what you've achieved against your log frame, which was usually written probably 18 months before the project even started. This does not encourage learning, this does not encourage us to learn as we go along and to adapt our programme. This says, you know, you have to go ahead and you have to deliver according to what's there. It has become, um, it's not just, e even where donors, we, we now have starting to get some, some, some donors coming through, far more flexible. But it's kind of difficult as an organisation to adapt our business models around that. So our finance department, for example, really struggle with the idea that, you know, you cannot start spending until you have uploaded your budget. And once you've uploaded your budget, you have to spend against that budget. And we don't necessarily have the systems in place to adapt and to learn and to change when something starts going awry. And we've already talked about the complexity of international development. Things do not go to plan. And so just carrying on and carrying on, and we're even judged often as our project managers on their spend against their plans. You know, and if you're not spending quickly enough, then there will be problems. There are implications for the organisation. We take overhead recovery on a project which won't be drawn down if you don't spend. So there's a real need to try and move away from these business norms which, which hold us in, in this place. Now for each of the, the, the challenges, there, is, there are also opportunities. Um, in particular, um, the new opportunities around adaptive programming that lots of people are talking about, which is starting to come through. We're starting to see this coming from donors. We have a particularly major resilience project with um, Zurich Insurance, 
who have given us very sort of loose framework to operate within and allowed us to learn. Um, the theory of change, I think, as an approach is very helpful in all of this. And personally, I've been diving a little bit recently into the agile project management ideas coming from the whole software development industry. This is the manifesto for agile. And it's all about, instead of, you know, here's my brief, go away, bring me back a piece of software in six months' time when you finished it. Very iterative, lots of processes underneath this, daily or weekly meetings between the customer and the, and the client, between the client and the, and the developer, so that you can sort of continue to move, recognising that as you develop a piece of software, your needs develop. Same surely is true in any international development project. Um, you know, you're continually talking to your users, your customers, your clients, your beneficiaries, whatever you want to call them, but the people that you're trying to work with in a partnership. And this isn't new. This is, this, is, this is something called participatory development that Robert Chambers and others have been talking about, about for many, many years. So this is something which I think is quite exciting. Um, it might find its way gradually into the international development industry. Um, and let's, let's hope that it does. The second P which again we've already talked about a little bit today, is promises. Um, there is bad news, I'm afraid. We are never going to reach a state of perfect knowledge. We are never going to be able to get all the knowledge that people need to improve their livelihoods into their hands in the right format at the right time. You know, I'm, a, I'm a, an enormous optimist, um, morals and values driven, I really want to work towards that, but we are never going to get there. The world is producing enough data every day to give every person in the world 870 newspapers. They cannot read them all. You know, we, we have to find ways of, of organising that data. And so, the, most likely, the, 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 you know, people will not have the, the data in the right format, um, or it may not even exist because of all the situations around what creates the knowledge in the first place that we've talked about. Now, faced by this reality, it's quite easy for people to be hoodwinked by an apparent solution. And Alan's already referred to this. Um, what do you think, you know, put it out there, what do you think might be an example of a solution which comes along to a management team and says, oh, we can organise your knowledge for you, everything's going to be fine. Any offers? Share. <laughs> there it is. The beautiful SharePoint. But you know, it, it is just one, one of many, many of, of these, um, these solutions, IT solutions, because it's easy. As, as leaders, as people controlling budgets, you are able to say, here's something which I can do to make this incredibly difficult situation better. Um, I joined Practical Action 11 years ago, um, 11 years ago this week. In my first week, we had a meeting where we agreed to um, start using SharePoint 2003, as it was, and we are still struggling with it. <laughs> you know, we are still trying to work out how to make it work best to get knowledge moving around the organisation. I mean, actually, to be honest, you know, we are in a much better place, obviously. You know, previously it was all on shared, on sort of shared drives between teams, things like that. It is better. But it was oversold, it was overpromised. It was, this was gonna solve all our issues, and it hasn't done. And as a result of that, of course, you find that when you go back to people and say, oh, I've got another solution, we can make things a little bit better, they're less likely to sign up to that. Um, it's certainly not been a panacea, and it burns people's fingers. Um, it's also not unusual. Um, it's all really similar to Jeff's point around portals. How many portals come along and sell themselves as being, this is going to be the one-stop shop, shop. This is going to be the place where you're going to find all the knowledge that you need to do X, to do development in India. Um, and I'm you know, guilty as charged. Um, I'm going to set up a group in a minute. It's called um, Portal Owners Anonymous. <laughs> uh, here's a portal that we launched two weeks ago. Uh, flood resilience portal with the Zurich Insurance Company. And this is, you know, this is a one-stop shop where, where you can go and you can find information about flood resilience in, in the developing world context. Um, I think, you know, to, to answer Jeff's point about, you know, do we pack up the portals and go, go to the bar? Um, Putting the information up there is a, is, a, is, is a good thing. You know, if we'd said 30 years ago, 
on the timeline that there was the potential to build a library, a global library, which in theory everybody could get into with all this knowledge in it, you know, pretty much all the knowledge that exists in the world, that we'd have welcomed that. And that in effect is what we've done with the internet. But what we haven't done is the next bit. We haven't really invited people in, we haven't trained them how to access that library, and we haven't dealt with the fact that actually some of the knowledge that people are going to need isn't even captured in the first place and has never been written down. So that's the kind of, you know, I see, see, see portals have been, you know, they're another book in the library, and we, we talk about, you know, ways in which we can, we can link them. Um, the opportunity um, in this area then are things, as has already been mentioned, great things around the open data movement, linked open data, the OK Hub that we partner with IDS with, with our Latin America office, <coughs> making knowledge available, linking it, it kind of still feels like it's very early days. It still feels like this is stuff which is at the cutting edge and not getting into the mainstream. But the potential is there to mash together that data and make it into something which is locally and contextually relevant. And I think there's some exciting, some exciting things in the pipeline there. Uh, another initiative a lot of you will have heard of is Godan, the Global Open Data. Initiative on Agriculture and Nutrition. Um, again, these, these are great discussions yet to kind of deliver things, but if we can, if we can move some of these forward, it will help us to navigate, navigate the mess which is the internet in effect. Third, um, third P, I've cheated a little bit, um, is poor leadership, um, not surprisingly. Um, how many, and then maybe, I don't know, I mean, perhaps this is different in, in a sort of, in an academia and in a research world, it would be interesting to discuss. How many of our leaders really do buy into digital? You know, many of our leaders, certainly, that I come across, um, think of digital, oh, oh, that's the website. That's the website. And certainly for us, the website is where we bring in money, or it's where we sell our books, or it's where we perhaps communicate with people. But it's, there's a very simplistic understanding of, of digital at the moment and the potential power. It's seen as being a channel and not as being core to our purpose and core to the objectives of what we're trying to achieve. We're going through a, um, a new strategic process at the moment and it's not really figuring and being how do we use and harness digital in, in getting information out and helping us to achieve our, our core, in our case, charitable objectives. I think it's changing slowly, probably is a, a generational thing as, as, as new and younger leaders come through, but I think, I think there's a lot still to be done. And then there's also an easy um, accusation as well, if you want to dismiss digital, you know, it, it, it's, it doesn't reach the last mile. You know, what, why are we bothering with websites? That's not going to help, you know, the farmer in the field in Africa, in Bangladesh, wherever. And just because you haven't got access to it doesn't mean it's not worth going some of the way there and then recognising that you also need to do the knowledge brokering that completes the last mile. You know, but it can become a very easy excuse. We presented, um, we have an annual, what we call a supporters day for practical action. Some of our, our sort of most loyal donors, we bring them together. Last year we presented them with four different knowledge sharing initiatives. We presented them with a call centre in Bangladesh. Um, with podcasting in Zimbabwe, with um, focus groups that we run with marginalised women in Nepal, and then with a digital presence in Peru. Now, the digital presence in Peru reaches, in terms of, you know, its visitors, however you, you, you want to measure them, far, far more people than any of the others. But to the practical action supporters, you know, they were much more interested in the other things. And when they, when they voted on which was the most worthy of support, the digital work came at the bottom. And that's, you know, okay, they're, they're not a hugely informed audience, but, you know, that, that is reflected, I think, in, ge in general terms in, in, by lots of people within our sector. So they see digital as a luxury and not something which is, which is yet to be prioritised. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm not putting this up there as it's all their fault. I'm putting it up there as we need to make the case much more strongly. Feels like we might have been doing that for a long time, but that we've got to keep on going and making that case. Um, there are, however, um, some, again, some opportunities in this area. Um, the value for money agenda, um, coming strongly out of DFID. You know, surely it is better that you, it is more value for money if your research is properly communicated than if it sits on a shelf or your learning can be shared. Um, but, 
you know, again, depends on who owns that value for money agenda in your organization. So in our organization, value for money is owned by the finance director. Um, and for him, knowledge sharing is an overhead, which is added on to something and therefore actually drives down our value for money. Whereas for me, it is something which drives up our value for money because it increases our impact. Um, so that's a, that's a bit of a double-edged sword. The other one, again, Jeff referred to, and it's, it's definitely in the ascendancy again in our organisation, is the learning organisation. Um, we're talking a great deal about it. Our new strategy is going to be an adaptive strategy. And we're trying to now work out how we make the space to do the learning um, and to retain the knowledge when people leave. Uh, you know, we have to see... The reality is that we're still at the sort of the, the, the big... Um, what was referred to the other day as unicorns and rainbows as part of our strategy, which is the sort of the, you know, <laughs> this is our, our global vision, but when that becomes a reality of a business plan, are we going to say that we will sacrifice the delivery of projects on the ground in order to, um, to make space for learning? And that's going to be a tough, tough argument, but I'm, but I'm hoping that we'll get there. I shall speed up. Um, the fourth P, people. Just a small, small problem. Um, we used to have professional information managers, people who process data. Um, here's some of them from the 1970s, it's but not entirely dissimilar to, um, to the picture of BLDS 30 years ago, but um, perhaps not quite as diverse as, as it needed to be. We, you know, people we used to employ people to do filing, to set up filing systems, to do information management. Now we don't do any of that. We just expect people to do their own. Do we train them? Do we spend any time at all saying to people, how do you train, how do you organize? You know, I mentioned SharePoint, we don't train our new starters in SharePoint, just go to SharePoint, go and put your stuff on it. If they're lucky, they work out how to upload a document, but in terms of structuring the data, so anybody can find it, not a hope. Um, so really important that we do that, and then look indeed at the new skills as well, skills like curation that we're gonna need to, to, to move on. Opportunity in this area, though, um, with people, as I've mentioned already, um, learning organisations, appraisal systems. We have knowledge management as a core competency for all 700 of our staff, you know, and the core core thing that we look at in recruitment and valuing the knowledge worker. Um, this was I was at a, a business conference at Henley earlier this year. They've done some analysis of um, the top flight companies, those companies who are investing in learning, and they found. These were some of the attributes that then came out as a result. So people are four times more likely to report they're responding faster to business change, three times more likely to report improvement in staff morale. So basically better businesses invest in learning, and that's kind of generally accepted, I think, in most progressive um, companies. And finally, fifth P is the lack of partnership. Um, you know, we, 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 we're one big happy family, right? We, 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 all, we all have a common cause, we're all working together, we all have a desire to make the world a better place. We're all really good at partnering and sharing, we spend a lot of our time doing it. So will you give me your data? Will you give me your content so I can, I can give it away? You know, these are not easy questions and often the answer has to be no or perhaps or under the following circumstances because they're my donors, and they're my relationships in reality, they're my intellectual property. I mean, we don't call it that, because we're all creative commons, but actually when it comes to proactively sharing, there's an awful lot of a road, road to go down. And I know that the Open Knowledge Hub has sort of had that, you know, with lots of people signing up in principle, and then the struggle of actually getting people to commit, to say, okay, take my information, do with it what you want, even if it's things like, I need the impact data because I have to justify my own existence to my managers. So lots and lots of problems with that. I work um, on flood resilience, as you see from, from my latest portal. Um, you know, we, there, we are finding, as our alliance, a new way of describing resilience. Um, the partners in it, the, um, we, we already had one, it was called V2R, Vulnerability to Resilience. The Red Cross have their own, it's called PCVA. Mercy Corps have something else. There are so many different approaches to resilience. I see Liz smiling, I know, and the, the whole BRACED program is that, you know, so many different approaches to resilience. Why? Why, why do we not all work together? Because, frankly, 
there's an element of this in it, there's an element of <coughs> brand, whether we like it or not, even lovely people working in the development sector have, have an element of brand to think about and an element of not invented here, we need our approach. We need, you know, a lot of our strategy process has been about what makes us different, not what makes us the same and where, where can we learn. Um, and then when you add to that the <coughs> intrusion into the sector that we now see as an increasing trend from the private sector, you know, which is, a, which is a good thing in general. There's lots of things that we can learn from the private sector. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the PWCs, the KPMGs, the Mott McDonald's, the present company um, accepted. Um, you know, we have our own practical action consulting. And some of our greatest challenges in knowledge sharing in our organisation are with our consulting company. Because their knowledge is their value. And so if they, give a, if they stick it up on the website and say to everybody, this is how we do this, then actually they really struggle to then sell their services. So there's a huge, you know, and this is, this is something which is not going to stop with the current sort of political direction. You know, we are very definitely going to have more and more private sector. So how do we get knowledge sharing working within that? Um, the opportunity here, I'll move through it, in a sense is because we are all being forced to work together through these enormous projects, these multifaceted, multi-stakeholder, omni-channel, omni-platform complex consortia with multi-million dollar <coughs> contracts, those of us who may or may not be big enough to manage them, they do force us to work together and there are opportunities to, to share that learning and move it around a little bit within the different actors of the sector. So that's it. Um, the, um, oh, I was going to just say on, on that one, you know, you, one of the ways that you can happen with, with those big kind of multi-sectoral things is donors can start to say, this is the approach that you have to adopt, which is an interesting thing. We, we have a, quite a lot of work with USAID and their ict for d project where they say, this is, you know, this is our learning, you need to adopt this, you need to show us how you're adopting that. Now that's fine to a point, but doesn't that lead you on a road to standardisation where then you can't begin to learn because nobody's trying anything new? Um, which is a bit of a challenge too. So, that sort of brings me to the end. Five Ps, um, projects, over-promises, poor leaders, people and partnerships. You know, if we could just solve those, then I think you know, we, can, we can all go home and we can go to the bar, Jack. <laughs> Thank you.